what made you suspect these patients were real and as opposed to many other clinicians just saying it's in their head because all of the investigations i'm sure would have come back normal mostly or if mostly. they didn't which yes which ones weren't uh, Philip, uh, initially, look, uh, with acute COVID, you see the acute markers going up very quickly. Your interleukin-6, your D-dimers, your C-reactive proteins. And when you treat those patients aggressively and appropriately, you see those values settle. So I had patients with critically high D-dimers, interleukins, and CRPs that I returned back to normal within a week with the right appropriate treatment. But when you get long COVID cases, the body has its mechanisms. Like if you look at wound healing, there's the initial intention to heal, which draws a lot of cells to that wound, and it triggers this initial intention to heal. But if that process does not solve the problem, then it turns into chronicity, and you get a second intention to heal, uh, which is through granulation tissue and all that kind of thing. So there's not a set mechanism when a body is fighting some offense. It has an acute phase where it wants to get over that as quickly as possible. But if you don't, then certain markers settle and certain other markers take over, and that results in chronicity. Ooh, and that's what just... COVID was looking at. So when you looked at the markers, there were no more there. Yeah. So hold on. A thought just came into my mind. Is this almost like a keloid? Yeah. So in effect, just as you said with skin, in terms of the wound healing, what it's happening with long COVID is almost an over response to the insult that leads to a permanent or a longer term action or injury from the immune system. Yeah. And like a wound will take longer to heal by second intention uh, with that chronicity in trying to overcome the offense, there will be some scarring involved. Mm -hmm. And so you might heal the wound and stop the bleed, but you'll always have a scar. And so when you're dealing with long COVID cases, the length of time that they've been allowed to persist with these symptoms will result in some permanent damage. So you find the longer the patient has been suffering with long COVID, uh, the less benefit you get from a standard treatment, meaning that the, 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 the ongoing process can be reversed but the injury and scarring that's resulted from the persistence of that process sometimes can't. And what do you make of, I, I mean, I say it all the time, that I put long COVID on the same spectrum of disease as fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. What do you think? I think, uh, Philip, you're absolutely right. Uh, I've been treating fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, yuppie flus, uh, those kind of syndromes uh, with a very different perspective. Uh, it's, it's very poorly understood why we have these kind of things happen. And I was always of the opinion that it is some kind of underlying immune-mediated response to a persistent pathogen. And that constant immune-mediated response results in all these other symptoms that we see. Now, uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome and, uh, and yuppie flus and uh, uh, ME. Uh, I, I read an article many years ago that spoke about rickettsial illnesses, intracellular parasites, how these are persistent. Our bodies learn to live with them. But we do have a low-grade immune response to these intracellular parasites being in our body. And this low-grade immune response when it deviates, presents as chronic fatigue and all uh, similar symptoms that you see in long COVID. Mm. Uh, very non-specific symptoms with many different systems that can be affected, uh, preferentially in some individuals. And so it complicates that picture. So uh, these, these kind of syndromes are difficult to treat simply because the patients present with very varying symptoms. And if you try and attack the symptomatology of the illness, then your pharmacy becomes too big in trying to choose how to treat it. So I looked at it and I thought, well, if I go back to understanding the rickettsial persistence, either a tick bite previously that wasn't treated properly or some sort of parasitic infe infection that wasn't treated properly, 
So I looked at it and I thought, well, doxycycline, again, has been the gold standard in treating parasitic infestations. But then logically, if uh, uh, I, think, I think all of God's creatures have some sort of intellect that allows them to survive their environments and thrive. And I think if you have an intracellular parasite and you uh, expose it to an antibiotic that's lethal, it will know to stay in the cell out of harm's way because the antibiotic doesn't have that great cellular penetration. So if you're trying to kill an intracellular parasite, which when it replicates, extrudes extracellularly, then you're going to have to consider using a pulse treatment where you stop treatment, allowing the parasite to exit the cell and then attack it again. Now, we do this for worm infestations where we understand the life cycle of worms so that we catch them in the juvenile state and kill them before they lay eggs and we wait for eggs to hatch and we know how long to repeat the, the dewormer so that you can kill all the young uh, worms before they lay more eggs. So you do a cycle of treatment so many weeks apart. And so I looked at this and I thought I should start trying doxycycline as a pulse therapy where I put patients two weeks on doxycycline twice a day and then two weeks off. And I found with, I've treated, I think, about 50 odd uh, cases so far with ME or, or chronic fatigue. And I'd say in about 80% of them, I saw benefit. But what I did, Philip, just to make sure that I'm on the right track with benefit, I didn't expose them to other medications. All I did, they've been trying everything all these years. Nothing seemed to work. And I said, look, just stop everything. I'll put you on doxycycline, two weeks on, two weeks off, and let's see how you do. And clearly, there was a benefit from it. So it shows that we don't understand the underlying immune mechanisms and how they present as symptom, uh, symptoms and pathology at the end of it.